I'm John Popwell, and for the last two years, I've been an application specialist with the Proteon, and in total, I've spent the last 10 years as an application specialist in the field of surface science. This webinar is entitled, Some Aspects of PR Data Analysis, particularly with respect to evaluating kinetic data. It might be subtitled, Assessing the Quality of the Data Produced. Focusing on data fitted to the Langmuir one-to-one model, we ask ourselves, so, we've produced association rate constants Ka and association rate constants Kd. Are they realistic to our samples? What sort of values might we expect? What is the association rate constant and what does it tell us? And more similarly, what is Kd and what does it tell us? We're also going to be looking at generating standard errors of the fit, otherwise known as t-values, and using them to help us decide whether the Ka and Kd values are significant parameters. How do these t-values link to chi-squared and the quality of the fit of the model chosen to the data itself? As distinct from producing standard errors of the fit, we'll be looking at producing average and standard deviation values for the kinetic parameters and how this is linked to performing a global versus local analysis. And finally, some experimental conditions and considerations if the data does not fit the expected model, the situations where refitting to a different model might be appropriate. An example of each will be illustrated with sensorgrams, and I promise to use as little mathematics as humanly possible. Thank you. And welcome to this webinar entitled Best Practices in Data Processing and Analysis to Achieve High Quality SPR Results. In this webinar, I'm going to start by illustrating the Langmuir model and then how the software produces rate constants from our data. Then I will go through an exercise where I show how to prepare data for kinetic fitting, evaluating the goodness of the fit to the model chosen, how to generate standard errors for the fit, as distinct from generating experimental standard deviations, and some examples of how not to generate standard deviations from your data set. So the Langmuir model, model the Langmuir model describes a simple one-to-one -one bimolecular interaction in which one ligand molecule interacts with one analyte molecule. In theory, the formation of a ligand analyte complex follows second order kinetics. But, because the majority of biosensors deliver the analyte at constant concentration, we can assume that it follows pseudo first order kinetics. In addition, the model assumes that the binding reactions are equivalent and independent at all binding sites. So, the Langmuir, the Langmuir model assumes that the interaction is one-to-one -one between the analyte and the ligand, which proceeds forward with a rate constant Ka, which is typically between 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 7, and AB falls back apart to its separate components A and B with a dissociation rate constant, which has the units of per second. Typically, these rates are between 0.1 and, for very slow dissociations, up to 10 to the minus 6. So for purposes of SBR, typically the ligand is coupled or captured on the surface and the analyte is flown over, denoted A here. They come together with a rate constant Ka and fall apart with a dissociation rate constant Kd, as illustrated in this graphic. Now A is the analyte in solution. We inject different concentrations of A over the analyte, over the ligand B, Thus A is known, it's the concentrations that we inject over our ligand. B is the ligand on the surface. And whilst we know how much we coupled or captured, B is an unknown because the amount captured or coupled is not the same as the activity. So B is an unknown, but we can model B in terms of how much A can bind to it. AB, of course, is the amount of the complex on the surface, so this is what the biosensor is measuring, the change in refractive index of the surface, which is directly related to the formation of AB. So AB is a known. The other unknowns in our situation here are the rate constants, Ka and Kd. So putting into our equations what we do and what we don't know, so as we said before, because the amount of analyte is constant, as it's depleted at the surface, it's replaced by that from bulk solution. So the change in the concentration of A, our analyte, with time is zero. The concentration 
of B with time is given by the equation shown, and similarly the change in concentration of the complex AB is given by the equations. As we said before, the amount of A, the analyte is known because that's what we're injecting over the surface, and B is an unknown. So one of the first things that the software does is it takes a guess at B max, and to do this it looks at R max. So in the sensorgram shown here, you can see that the surface response seems to saturate at around 80 RUs. So the software feeds that in. So now we have our B concentration, our B value in there. But this is the initial estimate. Of course, AB is the formation of the complex, and before the start of the reaction, the amount of AB, of course, is zero. So we can put zero in for AB at the start of the reaction, and Ka and Kd remain as the unknowns. And what the software does is it makes an initial approximation of the rate constants. So in the example I'm about to show, the dissociation rate constant is 10 to the 4, and the dissociation rate constant is 3 times 10 to the minus 4. And this is what you see in page 2 of 3 in the proteon kinetic analysis. You see these values appear before you get your actual values. And what the software is doing here is this is the initial estimates of the rate constants. What the software does is it changes the rate constants based on the residuals. So for the initial rate constant, it looks at the residuals, i.e. the difference between the experimental data, the blue line, and the fit data, the black line. So the residuals, which are the difference between the model data, the black line, and the experimental data, the blue line, are calculated. The software then changes Ka and Kd values to decrease the residuals and generate rate constants that are closer to the experimental data. So here is our initial rate constants. Then the software goes through many iterations to minimize residuals and generate rate constants that are match as much close as possible the experimental data. So initially we went from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the minus 3, and we end up with 8 times 10 to the 5 and 8.5 10 to the minus 5 for Kd. So the software went through many iterations to find the rate constant that more, most closely matched the experimental data. So my hope there was to show you what the software is performing when you're actually doing, when the software is doing its fitting. And now to go through a fitting exercise. So just before fitting, you need to make sure that there is a dose response, and I'll go through an example of that in a minute. You need to make sure that the baseline is stable before the start of the injection, as in the left-hand example. And you also need to make sure that there is dissociation. For systems where the rate constant, dissociation rate constant is 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, this can take minutes or in some cases hours for dissociation to appear, so you need to make sure that there is dissociation. And sometimes you need to, you need to zoom in on the data to correctly mark the start of the dissociation on the left hand plot and the dissociation on the right hand plot. So we're now going to work through a real example. So this is a data set, and the first thing that we check for is that there is a dose response, by which I mean that the highest concentration gives the highest response, etc. As we concentration is reduced, the response is reduced. Before exporting it for fitting, we need to check sure we've got a stable baseline, and that the data is correctly offset to zero for both the x and the y axis. And we also need to make sure that there is curvature in the sensorgram so that the computer can accurately predict as much as possible the maximum response. If the data is double referenced, real-time double referenced, for example, to A6, then it's important that the A6 is removed before it is processed, before it is fitted. There might be occasions where you need to move the red line, so the left-hand red line marks the start of the association, and the right-hand red line marks the, part, the start of the dissociation. And sometimes you may need to move those lines. 
the grey boxes denote whilst the software will fit at every single point along the sensorgrams, along the data, only the data in the grey boxes gets reported in the rate constants in the table at the bottom. So for example in the above if you chose to exclude this area here by not including it in the grey boxes it would not appear as part of, even though the data is fitted in the sensorgrams, it would not appear in the tables at the bottom. Having done all that, the next thing to do is a visual inspection. Do your fit lines pass through the experimental data? In other words, do they pass through the middle of any noise? So on the left hand side when you've got relatively slow dissociation, on the right hand side where you have faster on and faster off, the fit line still pass through the middle of the data. So in, the, in our continued example here you can see that the fit lines pass through, broadly through, the middle of the data. There is no systemic deviations anywhere. As opposed to this example here where clearly the fit lines do not pass through the middle of the data sets, this will be described as a a poor fit visually. After another way of examining the fit is to look at the residuals. So if you click on residuals, which is the tab next to the plot, you should see that the residuals are randomly scattered around zero, as in the red dots. There is no trend here, the residuals, that it's just representative of the random noise. As opposed to the lower plot where you can see there is a pattern to the residuals. There are parts where the model underestimates and where the part where the model overestimates the rate constants. So once the visual inspection is passed, i.e. the data, the fit lines pass through the middle of the experimental data, it is then time to look at the numbers. So these are our rate constants generated along with the R max and the chi squared. And the first thing I would do is look at the R max to see if it corresponds to the R max from the sensorgram, so you can see that the response is saturating around ATRUs, and this is indeed the reported R max value. In terms of the chi squared, and there was the difference between the fitted data and the experimental data, the bioevaluation software book says that in practice, chi squared values less than 10 are quote frequently acceptable. It's acceptable. So you can see here that the value is 3.1 and acceptable to that criteria. Many people though quote the chi-squared as a percentage of the R max and want between the chi-squared to be less than 5 to 10 percent of the R max. So in the example here, the R max is 80 and the chi-squared is 3.1 so it's less than 4 percent and this would be consider that the data is an acceptable fit to the model chosen. As opposed to our, other, our badly fitting example where the chi-squared is actually double the R max. This would be a grossly unsuitable fit. Okay, so now I promised that I would help generate statistics. So the standard error, as opposed to the standard error, it can be generated for each fitting parameter and it's an estimate of how sensitive the fitting is to changes in that parameter. This is as distinct from an experimental error that comes from repeating the experiment. So the standard error tells us if the parameter, for example, Ka or Kd is significant. In other words, if the parameter has a low standard error, if it's varied, the goodness of the fit will vary and the chi-squared will vary. People often ex express the standard error as a t-value. The t-value is generated by taking the parameter, for example, Ka, and dividing it by the standard error. And again, from the by evaluation software manual, t-values greater than 10 indicate that the value obtained for the parameter is significant. In other words, if you change Ka or Kd, then the chi-squared, the fit to the model, will change. So here's a worked example of this. Here are our rate constants. And then if you click show standard errors, you can see that the columns in beige appear where we get the standard error for the fit in these boxes here.
So then you can generate a t value, which is taking the parameter and dividing by its standard error. These values here. So in our case, that our t values are greater than 150, and so the bio-value emanation software indicates the t value is greater than 10, indicate that the parameter is significant. That's our standard error here, with the t value is 150, it means our standard error on the fit is less than 1%. So in other words, if we change now Ka or Kd, then the quality of the fit. So to give you an example of this, these are our this is our ongoing example. And to illustrate that this parameter is significant, we changed the Ka by a factor of two. And you can see the resulting effect on the fit. So the Ka is now halved. And you can see visually now that the data no longer fits, i.e. The, the, the fit lines, the black lines, do not go through the middle of the, the experimental data. And you can see now that our chi-squared is jumped to 74. It's almost the same as our max, and no longer meets our criteria of being only a few percent of our max. It's important to note that the standard error is not the experimental standard deviation, so Common pra best practice is to group together different concentrations and report a single KD value, the value in the red box here. Now, to, to obtain experimental standard deviation, the results must be repeated. The experiment must be repeated. For example, eject again and again. Collect together the different KD values and average these together to give your experimental average and standard deviation. So to quote David Mishka, the statistical error is the standard error, only tells us how well a parameter is defined for a model within a particular data set. To define the experimental error, you need to repeat the experiment. So he goes on to write, this may sound crazy, but to be a scientist often means you have to run the entire experiment more than once to see how the variables expect results. You would then take an average of the experiment of the experiments for the parameters and use their standard deviation to report the experimental standard devi standard error. So the last thing that I want to go through is global versus grouped versus local fitting. So in the example here, this would be on the left hand one is an example of global fitting. So what it means here is that the ligand on the surface on the four channels is the same. So the data from these four sensorgrams can be grouped together to report a single Ka or a single Kd. As opposed to the right hand example where the analyzer has grouped together the analyte injections but treated each ligand surface differently to generate separate KAs and KDs for each of the four flow cells. So this would be an example of a global fit where the antibody on the surface is the same for all of them. This data could be then all globally fitted together to generate a single KA and a single KD. That you can see here there is no per channel KAOKD is a single global fit. A grouped fit is often done when is done when the ligands are different. You can see here that each of the ligands is a different mutant, so a global analysis here would not be possible, and you would do a grouped fit, generating a different KA and KD for each flow cell with experimental replicates needed to produce average and standard deviations. The last thing to show you is when you can use a local fit. Now this is typically done, for example, in a fragment screen where you're injecting different compounds as analytes at the same time. So here, for example, we have four different compounds and because formally you can generate rate constants from a single concentration, we're able to generate four sets of we also generate a KD value for each of the four compounds injected A final sort of no-no for generating statistics is averaging together the results from a local fit to give you standard deviations. So 
fitting with local parameters incorrect to calculate statistics. So range results from a single concentration should be not regarded as replicate measurements, but they are variants within the same data set. So what happened here is somebody did a local fit for their sensorgram and they generated KA values, KD values, and then averaged them together. This is not the correct thing to do. You should group this together to generate a single KA value for the concentration series and then repeat the experiment for averaging. So hopefully I've shown you what the Langmuir model means, how the software produces rate constants from our data. It has an initial guess and then minimizes the residuals. Some tips for preparing your data for kinetic fitting, looking for dose response, etc. How you might evaluate the goodness of the fit by eye and then statistically. How you then generate standard errors for the fit and how these are different from generating experimental standard deviations and a final example of how not to generate experimental standard deviations from your data set. Thank you.